Ezekiel chapter number 14. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me. So there were some aged Jews that were ca carried off into Babylon. Quite a bit of a long journey for them. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. Now heart. 833 times in the Bible, 765 verses. The Old Testament, 666 verses. The New Testament, 66 verses. Quite a bit of a number when it comes to the heart. And notice it's not brain. It's not mind have set up their idols in their heart. So, you got a knick-knack. Your great-grandmother passed on to your, your, your grandmother, passed on to your mom, passed on to you. Is that an idol? Is it in your heart? Or is there something up there on, on the thing? Solomon had cherubim and palm trees and all kinds of decoration as a wallpaper in the temple. And yet, it was not served it was not honored it was there it was a decoration and there's a difference between idols and decoration if it's in your heart if it's something you got to clean if it's something you got to take care of if it is something that you're putting your hope in something that one day is going to make me money one day i'm going to wear it for this thing one day i'm going to it's become an idol in the heart and these are the elders that had put these idols in their heart that are in Babylon by the judgment of God placed upon the jealousy of God that they have turned from God to serve everything else but and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Now what may be an idol to you may not be an idol to me. And what is an idol to me may not be an idol to anybody else but we've all got idols we've got something that's more important than God in our life somewhere somewhere that we will brush off God to do what we what we want to do and a stumbling block is the idol it is stopping you from serving God should I be inquired of at all by them? They come to Ezekiel and God says, you know what? Why should I listen to them? If you see their heart like I see their heart, and that's what God sees. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord worketh on the heart. You may have a church full in a Bible-believing, born-again Baptist church. You may have a full, every pew is taken. But the Lord knows the hearts of everyone there. He knows who's there for him. He knows who's there because they've been forced to be. He knows who's there for a business deal. He, know, he knows. He knows in that room who is saved. And he knows in that room who is not saved. He knows that there is a sinner for all have sinned. But you know what? That guy is a sinner. He just really loves me. And he's battling. But he's trying to battle. He's trying to fight. These guys have set the idols in their heart, and we've seen with Jeremiah, they come to, to these men of God, and they really want to hallway past the sin, but these men will not give it to them. Well, let's see what God has to say. And if you've watched these videos of us on Saturday, you'll see a guy that comes up to us, and he's got plenty of stumbling blocks and idols in his heart. I've got a question. I've got a question. You don't want to know about God, and I'm not going to waste my time with you. And that's what God just told Ezekiel. So they don't care. And Ezekiel may not know that. He may think they're, they're, they're the original. They're the ones. Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. Realize anybody that comes to you may not be coming to you. They may be trying to, listen, all the time they were trying to catch Jesus, weren't they, with his words? 
Thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth a stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet. So he's got idols in his heart. It is his stumbling block. It is his iniquity. I'm going to come to the man of God. Now I can give you five good churches, at least a name, five good pastors, and you sit down and talk with it, and they'll say, "Yeah, we met with people in Isaiah, 4, I mean Ezekiel 14." And sometimes they don't even know who the men are, unless God reveals it to the pastor. They're phony balonies, oh, holy balonies. I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. God's going to answer him. According to the idolatry. Now, you think they're going to get a righteous answer? We're going to find a verse in here. It's going to be, whoa, the liberal will just fall down flat and have a heart attack of what God does. That I may take the house of Israel in their own heart. Because they are all exchanged from me. Through their idols. They don't have nothing to do with me. God says, I have nothing to do with idolatry, and they're involved in idolatry, and I have nothing to do with them, and they have nothing to do with me. Why are they even wasting their time coming to me? See, they know Ezekiel is somebody, they know Jeremiah is somebody, and they want their approval. They want the pastor to go along with their plan. They want the pastor to approve what they're doing. And yet, their heart is wicked. Their heart is against God. It make them feel a little good that God is using their conscience, which they want to shear, sear with a hot iron. You better not be the man behind the pulpit or, or a guide of a church or a Christian. You better not give in to these people. You better not give them an excuse. It is time for you and somebody like this, whether they're true or not, because you don't know, I don't know. You need to seek God in prayer and say, God, what's going on here? Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, turn yourselves from your idols, turn away your faces from all your abominations. God wants you to repent. Don't come to, listen, uh, J Joshua told him, you know, the famous verse, As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And they say, oh, we're going to serve the Lord. He says, you got to get rid of those idols. You know, it's recorded in that chapter. They never did get rid of them. Jacob picks up one day and says, we're going. He says, wait a minute, Rachel, hold on. Give me all that crap you took from your father. First of all, you stole it. Second of all, you lied about it. Third of all, you have spread this junk. This religious idolatry aids the worship. You have spread it amongst our whole entire camp. Dig a hole. Let's get rid of it. That's what you're supposed to do. What, what Jacob did. Bury it. And don't put a big X where it is. Bury it in the ground. Walk away. Don't ever come back to that spot again. Matter of fact, cut down that oak tree. So you don't know which oak tree it is. That's what God's doing. That's what God wants. And they can look back to the father of their race, Jacob, and see that he has done the same thing with the idolatry. Idolatry is bury it in a hole with dirt and don't go back to it. If it's a God, three days later, come out of, out of, not, none of them matters. And there's been illustrations I've heard of missionaries who have done that. They use the illustration about their idols and their dollies. They bury him in the ground. They say, well, do you serve a risen Savior? Yeah, I, I serve a risen Savior. Three days later, they've gone back to that place. Like Mary going back to the garden. They said, well, where's the hole? And took a shovel and re-dug that ground and pulled that idol up to their amazement that that idol stayed buried and it could not even lift itself out of the dirt. And that's the number one way to show these natives, these people in other lands, that their idols are nothing and can't do nothing. And they usually turn to the Lord Jesus Christ with full faith and full power and leave their idols. Only in America do they hang on to them 
and wear them around their necklace and wear them on their rings and get them tattoos and get them pictures and get them stuff for the dashboard or card and say, oh, it's an day to worship. God says, repent of it. God says, it's an abomination. What does God say? For everyone in the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, even the Gentiles. So there is no excuse for my idolatry. Jew or Gentile alike. So what do you think about the Christian? What do you think God says about it? That sojourneth in Israel, which separated himself for, from me, not to me, from me. You got idolatry, you are a division, not against the world, against God. And set up, a, and set up his idols in his heart. And put us the stumbling block. You see how this keeps going over and over. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Put us the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face. And cometh to the prophet to inquire of him. Concerning me, I the Lord will answer him by myself. Look how God keeps re repeating, repeating, repeating when it comes to idolatry. If there's one thing that God wants you to understand, it's not what the day of the Jesus Christ was born is he hates idolatry. Because when you come to the, the day that Jesus was born, look at the idolatry. The little baby, the little manger, the little shepherds, Mary, the Joseph, the little stable, whatever you want to call it. And we don't even know what any of that looked like. We don't, there are songs, you know, cows. that We don't know even what kind of place it was and what animals were supposed to be there. And we take that whole nativity scene, and that's idolatry. Because you bring it out, and you clean it, and you set it up every birthday of, of Baal, and you worship it. But God has repeated over and over and over. He is against idolatry. For everyone in the house of Israel, or the stranger that sojourns Israel, would separate himself from me and set up his idols in his heart and put us the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and come to the prophet to inquire of him concerning me I the Lord will answer him by myself and I will set my face against that man I will make him a sign in a proverb and I will cut him off from the midst of my people that cut off from the midst of my people in the Old Testament, that cut off means you died and went to hell. You know how you go to hell in the Old Testament? Commit adultery. You know how you go to hell in the Old Testament? Commit a murder. You know how you go to hell in, in the Old Testament? Have idolatry. What do you think God thinks of the of the lavishing television, movies, television shows that are in America today about murder, about adultery, and about idolatry? If you were a Jew in the Old Testament, the worst thing you could hear is cut off. And if the prophet, now God says, I'm going to answer that man that comes to, to a man of God. I'm going to answer you. You're not going to like the answer. Now the prophet, if the prophet be deceived, when he has spoken a thing, oh, go ahead. They're just worship. I can't think what it is now. They're aged to worship. It's okay. After all, we took it out of our Ten Commandment list and broke ten into two. How slick. All right, Mr. Priest. Wear your shirt on backwards. I'll tell you what God says. I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. How do you like that? You say, well, I know a guy down here. Man, that guy is so crooked, so behind that pulpit. He is so deceived. And God said, I may have done that. Now, if God deceives that prophet, who is sitting under that man listening to him? Do you think God's going to bless you? If you are sitting under a man that is deceived, have you studied and look at the word deceived in the Bible? And I will stretch out my hand, that's God, upon him, and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Man, you don't want to be a false prophet. 
You know what Paul does in the New Testament? He names them by name. And he tells them, get out from the assembly. Kick them out of the church. Have no fellowship with that man. Do you think God's very serious here? I think he is. Do you think he's really pleased when he says that I'm a jealous God when you put something ahead of him? And an idol can be a, a noun or a proper noun. It could be a person, place, or thing, or it could be just a capital letter. Lord, please don't come now. I want to go to Jellystone Park before you come back. Well, that's become an idol. Come over our house. Watch our pictures of the family. That's an idol rather than come in our house and let us tell you about Jesus. Let us tell you about our, our corporation, our business. This product I have to sell to you to make money. Then Jesus. That's an idol. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. You're going to get what they get. Hell. Burning in hell. That's a severe punishment. When you say, thus saith the Lord, and we've already read in previous chapters, God said, I didn't speak to you. I didn't say anything to you. What are you about putting words in my mouth that I never put there? Modern Bibles. You better be careful those modern Bibles because God has deceived those men that have written it. Go ahead, write. Rewrite my book. Go ahead, do it. And then you wait to the day you stand before my face. Just make sure or all the places in the Bible where it says about adding and subtracting, you copy that exact. You know those modern Bibles? When it comes to the verses about adding and subtracting, you know every one of those places are quoted verbatim to the King James Bible. It is so funny. They didn't change those. That's the verses I was going to change if I was going to change the Bible about what God really said. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it, and will break the staff of bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. He says, listen, when the land sins, when the people of the land sin, I'm going to send the lack of food. America has sinned against God. Well, we got plenty of food. If the Lord tarries, you may have to receive a mark to get that food. And 99% of Americans will be willing to receive that mark to get a cheeseburger. 99.99873% will be glad to receive that mark to get a beer. So famine and the cutting off of bread. Remember Jeremiah? He finished the last of the bread while in jail when Babylon sacked and destroyed Jerusalem. Jeremiah, I mean, Ezekiel is prophesying of what Jeremiah is going to see soon. False prophets and idolatry and sin and trespass brings a lack of food. So, what about this nation where they're starving? You mean where they have a bunch of cows running around and think they're gods? That when a cow pees, they go wash their head under it, thinking it's holy? You know, if they killed Grandma and Grandpa and Uncle Joe and all that, they would have enough hamburgers to live. Not my fault they're dying. Satan's fault. Though these three men, Noah, overcame the world. Daniel overcame the government. Job overcame Satan. Were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by the righteousness, by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. That's Old Testament. Old Testament, your righteousness can save you. Job was, was self righteous of all perfect ways, like that rich young ruler that came to Jesus. 
He had to offer up a sacrifice for his friends. Daniel helped out Shadrach, Meshach, and Indigo, and other Jewish uh, men and women. Noah, the seven members of his family. And God said, well, here we are in this time, only Noah would come out. The heck with his family. Only Daniel would come out. The heck with the rest of the Jews. Um, did you just see what, who, who Ezekiel said? You know, a lot of people question Daniel, and Ezekiel said, Daniel. Daniel is living around Ezekiel. And Job, the heck with your three friends. The heck of your resurrection of your children, Job. Only you come out of it if this conditions lack. And Noah was the only man that, that found grace in God's eyes. Daniel was one of three that get the, 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 the praise and the honor of God that Gabriel came down and talked to Daniel. Gabriel came down and talked to John the Baptist's father. Gabriel came down and talked to Mary. We're in it. They should deliver but their own souls. No one else by their righteousness. Save the Lord God. Okay? Lack of bread. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land. Dogs that devour. Bears that come into your swimming pool and have fun. Save the animals. God says, go ahead. And when they run out of food, I'll feed you to them. And they shall spoil it. And they spoil it so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beast. All right? Not only are you going to have a lack of bread, the animals are going to be hungry, and they're going to come after you, and they're going to make you scared. You don't think that's bad? There's going to be a lack of bread in the, in the tribulation. There's going to be some wild beasts in the tribulation. We're looking at a tribulation passage here too. Because the, the land has sinned completely. Satan is sitting on the mercy seat. Alright. Though these three men were in it. Noah, Daniel, and Job. As I live, saith the Lord. This is an oath of God. As I say. As I. Yeah, as I live, saith the Lord. That is an oath. By God. Through God. They shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. Who's that sound like? Noah and Job. We don't know. I don't know if Daniel had children. He became a eunuch. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Uh, I was going to say the famine. Uh, the Book of Lamentations. And then when they come through Ezra and Nehemiah, there's really no one there. All right? No bread, famine, animals going berserk. You know, your turkey eats you and your chicken eats you. Rather, you eat the turkey. And it... Or, if I bring a sword upon the land, war, and say, sword, go through the land. So that I cut off men and beasts from it. I'm going to kill the animals now. After they digested humans, I'm going to kill them. And I'm going to kill the men that are left from the beasts. That are left from, from not having any food. So these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Oh, wait a minute, animals. Which two of those men had animals in their lives? Noah and Daniel. Noah brought them into the ark. And Daniel had a craftmatic, pearlmatic, smooth lion mattress in the lion's den. To him it was a den to sleep on. Job lost all his animals. By death or by theft. Study Noah, Daniel, and Job and all these. 
Yeah, I heard that if Noah would live today, he would be in great trouble with the law. You say, why? Well, God told him to bring a male and female of every species of animal. But today in America, they would find him and put him in jail for not bringing sodomite animals into the ark. Two male animals and two female animals, you know, you bring it up to date. But look how these things are being passed onto these men. And what we're reading about. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord, the second oath, they shall neither deliver their neither, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Now this is a passage, and the sword is going to go through the tribulation. That is one of the horses of the apocalypse, they say. You know, sort of the, the horse of the apocalypse. But that's one war and famine. It would be part of the horses. If only three men out of all the men in the Bible, in the Old Testament, as written up to Ezekiel, are going to survive, how many Jews do you think are going to be found in Sailor Petra? Not many. We're not done yet. You, know, you better hope that the Lord comes before he passes these judgments upon him. How would you like to live through no land? I mean, excuse me. How would you like to live when there's no food in the land? Would you like to starve to death and being weak and then have your animal, your pet, want to turn and eat you? And then after that, have war come to the land and trying to duck guns and missiles and swords and everything. Would you like to do that? America is where we are right now in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Verse 19, we're not done yet. Or if I send a pestilence into the, that land, cancer, AIDS, mildew, isn't that another? Mold, isn't that another one? Isn't that described in Leviticus 13, 14 as one of the things of leprosy? Um, what is that disease that where Brother Holt is? Went through? Ebola is, is that one but over in Sierra Leone that disease that just went rampant they shut down areas e Ebola. Ebola they got E. coli that's that's shutting down restaurants in the West Coast today chickens are getting sick eggs are sick mad cow, mad cow. Everybody's getting the flu. Wouldn't you call that a pestilence? You go into the hospital and you come out sicker than what you went in for. And, and pour out my fury upon it in blood. Now, is that pestilence in the blood or does it result in bleeding? To cut off, to cut off from it man and beast again God's not much for saving animals imagine a guy sitting on a dock and he's fishing a big great white jump up and eat him we got people get bit by sharks down here all summer long but sharks, they don't. You know, they're always protecting the sharks. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, oath number three, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. All right, who had the pestilence? Job. Wouldn't you think that God protected Noah and his family from some of the animal diseases? And I don't know about Daniel. I don't know if lions carry anything that he could have caught. But don't you see these three men in these passages? You see how angry God is at what's been the subject? Idolatry. And it's happened after the land has been judged and taken to Babylon, they're still doing it. 
You know what some of the stuff that was that they carried to Babylon was their idols. Now don't think about it. Isn't it really stupid? Here you believe in a, in a wood or plastic or stone god. And yet he couldn't deliver you from a Babylonian army god. And you are brought to be carried into the enemy. And here you're carrying the, the failure god. St. Christopher used to be, and listen, I was Roman Catholic. St. Christopher was this guy to put on your dashboard. He was to protect your journeys. He was a triple A of all gods. One day, finally, I was conclude the fact is that St. Christopher found himself in a very uh, bad place in life. They kept finding St. Christopher in the car junkyard with a lot of cars that had been involved in automobile accidents. So as a result of that, St. Christopher was fired from protecting you from autom automobiles. It didn't help you. And the problem is with idolatry, when you find out that Mary can't help you, it is too late because you will hear her son tell you, depart from me, into, uh, uh, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But didn't I pray to your mother? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Didn't I have her in the front lawn and I washed her down and I cleaned? Listen, you had to keep Mary clean. Listen, if Mary is a god, why can't she take her own bath? Why do you got to bathe your God? For thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God. That's where it counts. The Lord God. How much more when I send my four sword judgment upon Jerusalem? The sword. The famine. The noisome beasts. And the pestilence. Isn't that what Jeremiah was preaching outside the, the noise and beast? Is that what he kept saying over and over and over and over that we studied the 52 chapter? Aren't those the things that you're going to see in the tribulation period? Those those things that come out of the hole of the earth and they're, they're like scorpions. They, got, they look like horses and they stab you and you are tormented for months and you wish you could drop dead and you can't? Yet, behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Didn't Noah have sons and daughters come out? Sons and daughter-in-laws? I don't know about Daniel. But didn't Job have his sons and daughters resurrected after 42 for him chapters 42 months behold they shall come forth unto you Noah saw his his family Job saw his family in the end the only one he never saw was his wife you know it's funny and I don't know anything I can't say you never hear anything about Noah's wife and who's the Bible tell you what wife are you to to remember Lot's wife didn't he come from a city that had a mass destruction a fire and hail that you see in the tribulation period didn't he try to bring out his sons and daughters he did he brought out his wife and his two daughters and him and his two daughters were the only ones that got free and the Bible calls him a just man. See, we're not only reading the, the, the final time that Jerusalem is going to be sacked and attacked by the Babylonians. We're also jumping into when the Antichrist will be in Jerusalem. Fourth and you, ye shall see their way and their doing. Ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem. Now remember, evil is the result of sin. So what God is doing to Jerusalem, or will do to Jerusalem, what he has done in Ezekiel's time, what he will do in Jeremiah's time is because of sin. So why the tornadoes? Why the earthquakes? Why the volcanoes? 
Why the earthquake? That is the evil of God, yes, because you have sinned against the land. You praise the weathermen for, for rain for your cross, but you don't thank the God, the Creator. You praise God that it didn't rain on your picnic, yet you don't give Jesus Christ the credit. Even concerning all that I have brought upon it, and they shall comfort you when ye see their ways and their doings, and the comfort they're doing right for some reason, they're not doing bad. They have repented, they have gotten right, and their ways will make you happy. And ye shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord God. Now God did not do it for vain, he did it for a reason. It's a correction. The motive is to get you right and get you back under God. He didn't do it to be a meanie. He did it for you to repent, get those idols out, and get back to him. And the problem is, the Bible says many will go the broad way. Sometimes you may think it's tragic, the earthquake. You may think it's tragic that there was a death in someone's family. It may be for God to say somebody to look at that and to think about themselves. And whatever, I can't say what it is because there's so many ways and so many angles that you are to look at God and say, I need to repent and get right with my life. And there's sometimes you have to pray, and I've done it. You really want someone saved? You got to stop asking God to bless me. You got to say, God, you got to turn the fire up. And be wise. If your heart is right with God, He will turn the fire up. He will do what He needs to do to reveal to that person the judgment of God. And it may hurt you, it may frighten you, it may even get you to get right. Sometimes a little fire. You take a needle, you put it in a fire, and you sterilize it to, to get that sliver out of your finger. Sometimes in a person's life, a little fire is good. A little trouble. A little spanking. You love your child. The Bible says if you love your child, you will correct your child. You will prevent them from what? Hell. So when you look all around and see what God is doing, and God is involved some way, whether he gives Satan the permission or God's doing it himself, God is long-suffering. He is doing it for judgment upon sin, which is called evil. And there are some people that he's doing it to say, hey, listen, look at what I can do. Look at the judgment. Look at the death. Now get right. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing to have a city destroyed and stand before the great white throne judgment and find out that that city was destroyed for you to get right with God and you never did? That's one of the things God will do. He will have some people suffer for someone else's advantage. I don't like that. We read that in Jeremiah. He may have you suffer and give you the ability to suffer and go because someone else needs you to go do that. Someone else needs to see you. Someone else needs to see the victory of Christ in your life. Don't give up. Someone's watching you. And that's a very hard thing. But know that God has done it not without cause. There is a reason. And only he knows sometimes. Maybe he'll show us. Maybe he won't. You need to get out of your sin. You need to repent. You need to get right. You need to turn to God and serve him and serve him alone.